Uh, calling the meeting back to order. A um, few members still um, trickling in here, but um, we did uh, skip number nine, and so we'll go back to that. I think are they here? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, talking about Minnesota's mineral rights overview updates, and we have uh, uh, with us uh, Assistant Director Susan. Uh, is it Damon? Damon. Damon. And um, uh, it doesn't look like Joe Henderson to me. No. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you uh, uh, be so kind to in introduce yourselves for the record? Of course. My name is Vicki Sellner. I'm one of the attorneys with the Lands and Minerals Division of DNR. <laughs> and Susan Damon, Assistant Director for Lands in the Division of Lands and Minerals. And that title is a little bit misleading because um, I also work very closely with our legal unit. Um, in fact, I, I, I supervise the attorneys in our Division of Lands and Minerals, and uh, they are very heavily involved in mineral leasing and um, mineral rights and other issues. So uh, well, while I primarily work on lands, I have uh, quite a bit of interaction with minerals issues as well. Well, well welcome, and we'll look forward to your uh, overview and update on mineral rights. Okay, thank you very much for inviting us here today. Um, I just first wanted to let everybody know that uh, Vicki Sellner is uh, probably the state's premier minerals expert. Uh, she's been with the DNR for about 30 years. Um, she works on lands issues as well as min minerals issues, but she has incredible expertise um, for, uh, with all things that pertain to minerals. So you'll have an opportunity today to ask her questions um, about any minerals issues that uh, you would like to know about. So what we're going to do in this presentation, we're going to divide it up. Um, first, we're going to talk about mineral ownership and severed minerals in Minnesota. And then we'll have a, a discussion of state-owned minerals and some of the issues surrounding state-owned minerals. And then finally, we'll wrap up with um, LSOHC projects and minerals and the intersection between land protection and minerals issues in Minnesota. So first, uh, you may or may not be aware that uh, a majority of mineral rights in Minnesota are owned by corporations and individuals. The state of Minnesota is the largest single mineral rights owner in the state, and the state owns about 24% of all mineral rights. Uh, most of the state mineral interest, uh, we have a map a few slides ahead, uh, most of that state minerals interest uh, is concentrated in northern Minnesota, particularly in the northeast. Um, the United States is also a large uh, mineral owner, and um, the United States owns about 7% of the mineral rights in Minnesota, and that excludes the lands that are held in trust for tribal nations. Uh, most of the federal mineral rights are in the Superior and Chippewa National Forests. Okay, well, let's jump into mineral rights. And in order to understand mineral rights and how they get severed, we need to know a little bit about some real basic property rights. Uh, real property ownership consists of how we uh, view in the legal uh, profession as a bundle of rights, like a bundle of sticks. You can give parts of your sticks to somebody, giving you different rights, or you can hold all of them together. Uh, a fee estate consists of both your surface and your mineral estate together. One owner owns everything. You can also own your surface alone, and somebody else owns the mineral rights. Or vice versa, somebody can own just the mineral rights, somebody else owns the surface rights. The most common question I get regarding mineral rights is, what's the depth? How many feet below the surface does mineral rights start? There is no depth. Mineral rights are wherever the minerals happen to lie. So it depends on your document that severed those minerals are talking about minerals. The minerals could be several hundred feet below your surface, or they could be right on top of your surface with a rock outcrop. And just like any piece of real property, mineral rights can be sold 
and owned separately from the surface, just like any other piece of property. It can have its own chain of title once it gets severed from the surface. And that's what we call severed minerals. It means that you're separating or severing it from your surface ownership of what you actually see of your land. So how are mineral rights severed? The most common way that mineral rights are severed is somebody owns a piece of land where they own the minerals and, and the surface together, and upon the sale of the land, that owner keeps the mineral rights to themselves. So the, the surface rights go off with somebody else. That previous owner kept the minerals. The state does this um, whenever it sells or exchanges land. And our reservation language is very basic. It's uh, accepting and reserving to the state of Minnesota all minerals and mineral rights in the real property. When there's a sale of tax forfeited land, the deed that comes out of the Department of Revenue will state something very similar, stating accepting and re reserving to the state of Minnesota for the taxing districts all minerals and mineral rights. Mineral rights can also be severed by an instrument that conveys just the mineral rights. So I might own the surface and the, the, and the minerals. Maybe I'm conveying the mineral rights to somebody else. So I kept the surface but conveyed the minerals out. And the mineral estate is defined at however that document severing those mineral, minerals reads. So like we see with our um, language above when the state of Minnesota severs, we're saying all minerals and mineral rights. Somebody severing minerals might be very specific about what minerals. Might be gold, might be silver. Um, a very common reservation that I see, um, especially with dealing with railroads in the past, is that they just accept out the coal and the iron. They reserve those and the rest of the mineral rights go on with the surface. Uh, sand and gravel and peat are considered surface interests, but rather than a mineral interest in Minnesota, but many times those are also included in reservation language. So you can see that very commonly with mineral reservation language saying they're also reserving sand and gravel um, also very common, especially in the railroad days, uh, where you might see in the mineral reservation somebody reserving timber rights also. Again, that's a surface right. So how can a property purchaser find out if the mineral rights are severed or if they're with the surface that they're intending to buy? The only way to find that out is reviewing the title to the particular parcel of land looking at a complete abstract of title or looking at the certificate of title if it's registered property. Um, some of the caveats with that is you want to make sure that your title, or your abstract of title covers mineral rights. Uh, many times because many of the uh, transactions that go on, someone is only concerned with the surface, um, especially with residential property. So a title company might not include any mineral ownership in that abstract of title. So you want to make sure that the minerals are included and in that if there was a potential severance, that title company is also including all of the documents that might relate to mineral rights. Severed mineral ownership is not subject to the state's Marketable Title Act. Uh, the Minnesota's Marketable Title Act um, has uh, examiners going back 40 years in a land title to see if there's any problems that need to be resolved and that make that property unmarketable. Mineral rights does not fall into that category. So you cannot just look at an abstract going back 40 years. You actually have to look at an abstract going all the way back to the beginning of when the United States owned the property and conveyed it out. You must look at the entire abstract. Um, a title, um, uh, normally with a marketable title with a 40-year search, um, you're trying to resolve more recent problems with the land. And title examiners have ways of discounting things that happened maybe 100 years ago or even longer than that in time. Not so with mineral rights. The mineral severance could have happened 100 years ago, and that severance is still valid. The deed language that conveys or reserves mineral rights will show what specific minerals are reserved. Again, 
looking at the actual language. Is it talking about all minerals and mineral rights or only specific mineral rights that were conveyed or reserved by someone? So you have to be very particular about looking at that language and seeing what it says. Maybe you're getting to this, but um, so in that case, if there are other minerals that are not reserved, does the surface owner then own those minerals? Yes, the surface owner would retain that until some other time that maybe another deed conveys those minerals. Yes, so that is retained. Mineral interests are, can be inherited just like regular real property. It can go through a probate process where if somebody passes away and uh, you don't have it in joint tenancy, meaning a survivor just automatically gets that property, it would have to go through a probate process to determine who are the heirs and who would be the owner and how much percentage of ownership they would have. Um, and they can be very, because of that inheritance, mineral rights can become very fractionalized over time. Uh, this is especially true on our three iron ranges, the Vermilion, the Masabi, and the Cuyuna range, where there was iron ore um, and taconite uh, mining and other areas that may have had mining in the past. You see a lot of fractionalization of the minerals. And in fact, just last week, the DNR had a, mineral, a taconite lease um, up in the Hibbing Taconite area approved, and the state's ownership was only a 145th interest in the minerals. The rest of the minerals were owned by private owners. As of 1974 in the state of Minnesota, all severed mineral owners must file a statement of severed mineral interest, claiming their mineral interest and agreeing to be uh, assessed tax on that severed mineral interest. This is one way that we can find out who are the mineral owners and um, also brings in some revenue for those severed minerals, uh, meaning it's a real property right and needed to be taxed. So the next thing is, uh, what, how do you locate a severed mineral owner? If they file the statement of severed mineral interest in the county recorder's office, that statement requires an ownership address, an address to send that tax statement to. So that's one way that you can find out where is that owner located? Who's the owner? What's their address? Uh, you can also check with the county auditor's office for any updates for that address. Um, somebody may have filed their statement maybe in the early 80s and may have moved several times since they filed that statement and still hold their ownership. If a statement is not filed, so they own severed minerals, they didn't file a claim stating that they own those minerals, Another way of finding where that last owner of record is, is by looking on the severance deed where they got the mineral ownership. Many times that will show a city or town where they lived or, and the state, possibly the county, um, may not give you a specific address, but it at least gives you a starting point. Um, another way of doing that is um, uh, also with uh, not only the statement, uh, but is there a subsequent conveyance of those mineral rights by that person? Uh, again, you look to see, you know, did they put in the blank on the conveyancing blank of the deed where they were located? If no statement is filed within one year of you owning mineral rights, either severing them or acquiring them, the state then now has an ownership claim to those mineral rights due to forfeiture. The DNR would have to go through a court proceeding in order to finalize the forfeiture. Uh, and, and part of that is giving the, those owners uh, an opportunity to be heard in the court and an opportunity to explain, maybe did we get something wrong in the county records? Did the county records really reflect that they were the owner and that those mineral rights should not be forfeited to the state? Okay, so now we'll talk a little bit about state-owned minerals. The state of Minnesota owns approximately 12 million acres of mineral rights. Uh, the state owns a surface of about 8.5 million acres. Uh, that includes DNR-administered land as well as uh, tax-forfeited land uh, to which the Commissioner of Revenue holds the deeds and those lands are administered by the counties. Uh, the state owns the mineral rights in some of these uh, parcels, but not all. And then the remaining 
state mineral ownership is in severed mineral rights. The state has mainly acquired its mineral interests through congressional grants, uh, such as uh, conveyance of school and university lands and minerals. Uh, the state also has acquired um, millions of acres of uh, mineral rights through tax forfeiture, um, through purchase, and through gift. And the state also acquires minerals through mineral owners non-compliance with Min Minnesota's severed minerals um, interest law. And that includes failure to file the statement of severed uh, interest with the county report recorder, or in some cases, failure to, file, uh, to pay that severed mineral tax um, if those uh, minerals have not been previously uh, severed, then the state acquires those, um, those rights. Um, the state is required to reserve its mineral rights by the Constitution in land exchanges. And starting in 1889, the state also began to uh, reserve its minerals in land sales. Uh, state law now requires the state of Minnesota to uh, reserve those rights. Um, as Vicki mentioned, when tax forfeited land is conveyed, those mineral interests are reserved in trust for the taxing district. So the state as a mineral owner um, primarily manages its mineral interests as a fiduciary, uh, and that is to benefit the schools, the university, and the taxing district. Taxing districts. Um, the revenue distribution from mineral leases and um, uh, so <coughs> rentals and royalties depends on the land class. So, depending on how the state acquired those uh, mineral interests. Um, but most of our mineral rights uh, that are leased are school. Uh, trust minerals, university trust minerals, and tax forfeited minerals. We also lease a number of uh, consolidated conservation lands, minerals. Um, there is um, the minerals management account, uh, which uh, explains how revenues are distributed. Um, when we receive revenues from rentals and royalties uh, from uh, mineral leases on school trust land, university trust land, tax forfeited land, there's 20% uh, of those royalties um, go to the state's management of its mineral interests. And then um, there are also periodic sweeps. Uh, uh, there's a, a balance in that account of uh, $3 million and there are periodic sweeps where they go back to uh, the fund um, that the, the, that is related to the land class. Um, so 80% of the revenues uh, then from re revenues, including rentals and royalties from state mineral leases on school trust lands um, are deposited <coughs> into the permanent school fund. Uh, minerals are the largest source of revenue uh, for the permanent school fund, which is now valued at $1.5 billion, and interest income and dividends from this permanent school fund are distributed annually to public schools throughout the state of Minnesota. Um, there are also university trust fund lands and revenues from uh, mineral activity on those lands uh, is de deposited into the permanent university fund, and interest and dividends on those uh, on that fund are distributed for scholarships for students at University of Minnesota um, and mineral research at the university and scholarships and funding for a mining engineering program. Uh, tax forfeited uh, mineral revenues are um, distributed to the taxing districts um, and it benefits the schools in the tax taxing districts where the leases are located, um, benefits uh, the, the town or the city, um, and also benefits the county. Um, we are not authorized to ever sell, um, extinguish, or impair our mineral rights um, as uh, representatives of the state of Minnesota. Uh, we very often get calls from, for example, solar power companies um, are, are working with a private landowner and there may be tax forfeited minerals 
under the surface and they want to know if the state will extinguish its mineral rights and we have to say we, we cannot, um, in accordance with law, we cannot um, extinguish our mineral rights or impair those rights. So you as members of the Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council are um, um, in the business of protecting land and protecting wetlands, prairies, forests, and habitat for fish, game, and wildlife. And so what we want to talk about now is the intersection between land protection and minerals. And the state itself, the DNR, um, has a, a dual mission um, with regard to land protection and also its fiduciary obligations with regard to minerals. And so um, we're very familiar uh, with land protection issues and uh, how to deal with uh, mineral interests uh, when we're working on land protection. So how should an outdoor heritage fund recipient address mineral issues in the acquisition of land or in conservation easements? One, the, the best way of doing this is to ensure that your seller or your grantor possesses all of the property <coughs> rights, including the mineral rights. Then that ensures that your conveyance of land or a conveyance of a conservation easement includes the mineral rights also. You don't have another owner hanging out there. Another way is to ensure that that seller or grantor or anybody else who possesses rights in the property are parties to the acquisition or to the easement transaction. Um, if the owner does not own all of the mineral rights or all of the property rights, you would want to have those other owners also be parties to that transaction, parties to that deed or to that conveyance of a conservation easement. Then those, all those other rights are included in the acquisition. What if you can't get all of those parties involved or agree to be parties to that deed or to that conveyance of a conservation easement. What are the mineral owner's rights? Minnesota courts have not addressed this question specifically regarding what is a surface owner's rights versus a, a severed mineral owner's rights. Um, around the states surrounding Minnesota, it is general that the mineral estate is the dominant estate meaning that the mineral right owner has a right to use as much of the surface as may be reasonably necessary to reach and remove the minerals underneath the property. The mineral owner is, of course, then responsible for damages to that surface owner, either restoring the property or providing a monetary um, amount of money to replace the, the value of that land. Again, this has not been addressed in Minnesota through its courts yet. Some of the options um, regarding if an agreement cannot be reached with a mineral owner would be that uh, when title research is completed on a piece of property that is gonna be conveyed either for preservation or for a conservation easement and severed minerals are, are noticed and found, uh, to have that party conduct a mineral potential review, looking at what is the potential for mineral development in a particular parcel. Um, nonprofits can do this by contracting with a licensed professional geologist, and they can do that geologist can deter determine the mineral potential of the parcel or the parcels involved with the conveyance. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, so. Based on what you said about the ownership of the state of Minnesota and they can't distinct, extinguish their rights, mm -hmm. can there be a conveyance of any of these lands if the state of Minnesota is the No, the state owner? of Minnesota cannot be party to conveying any of its mineral rights. And so we, so we can't do any con We any can't do anything regarding being part of that conveyance. Um, as Susan will um, detail in a, in a couple slides here, we do have some ways that we have been resolving some of those issues. So another type of an agreement might be needed. Okay. 
Now, of course, in, in the state of Minnesota, we know a lot about mineral rights and uh, mineral potential in the northern tier of the state, um, just because of the large amount of exploration that has been done and mining that has been done. Um, in the south and the west, we have very limited information about mineral potential. And that's mainly because of the glacial drift that is there. You know, the minerals and the bedrock is several hundred feet below the surface, and there just has not been a lot of exploration there. So sometimes um, the state finds that it is uh, trying to protect land, and it also holds the mineral rights and has fiduciary, fiduciary obligations in that regard. Um, and so this happened um, not too long ago with a very large uh, Outdoor Heritage Fund project, and I'm sure that you're probably all familiar with the UPM Blandon easement that was largely funded uh, by um, Outdoor Heritage Fund funds. And uh, that easement um, covers about 187,000 acres. And... Um, there are substantial state mineral interests um, underneath the, the lands that are owned by uh, UPM Blandon. And so our forestry division was working on this conservation easement uh, uh, with the purpose of trying to uh, prevent forest fragmentation, preserve habitat, preserve um, outdoor recreation opportunities, and um, preserve a, a working forest um, rather than having the UPM Blandon lands sold off in individual parcels for um, house, houses or uh, individual recreation. And we were able to negotiate um, a conservation easement um, funded largely by Outdoor Heritage Fund money. <coughs> um, this easement uh, covers land in, in seven different counties and we developed some language that we think strikes a really good balance between the state's fiduciary obligations as a mineral owner and uh, our meeting our <coughs> land protection um, mission. And uh, one of your handouts is um, the actual easement language that addresses minerals. Um, as we mentioned, we can't sell uh, we cannot abridge or limit the state mineral rights, and we made that clear in the language of paragraph uh, 5.2. And we approached the mineral issues uh, with the tiered approach. Um, first, there's a paragraph that deals with uh, mineral exploration and makes clear that we do have the right to authorize exploration for state-owned minerals um, and state-owned sand and gravel, um, which are surface interests. Um, and those um, activities have to be conducted in accordance with state law, as they always are under state mineral leases. Um, an explorer who ha holds a state mineral lease has to submit an exploration plan. Um, if they are going to do any surface disturbance, do any um, drilling for minerals, they have to restore, uh, restore the property to the condition that it was in prior to that exploration. Um, there are a lot of misperceptions about uh, what state leases are and what exploration um, in the state of Minnesota is. Um, of all of the 40-acre parcels, from the millions of acres that the state has leased, for example, for non-ferrous mineral exploration um, since 1966, only about 2% of those parcels have ever had uh, one drill hole. Um, so the vast majority have never even had a drill hole. There are other far less um, invasive types of exploration. Uh, sometimes uh, explorers will just, they'll do flyovers, they'll do geophysical studies, you know, just setting some instruments on the ground, uh, they'll collect some gr glacial till or rock samples. Um, and so in the vast majority of, of, of lease parcels, uh, there's n nothing that would really even have to be restored. Um, I'd also like to say that with uh, the state's mineral leases statistically, 
99% uh, of all state non-ferris leases are terminated within 10 years and about 84% are terminated within um, a five-year period. Um, our leases are um, drafted in accordance with a rule that contains terms that have to be included. Uh, we have an escalating rental schedule and it starts out at $1.50 per acre and eventually those rentals go up to $30 per acre. And that encourages um, mineral explorers to acquire the lease, get in, do exploration. If they don't find anything, they will voluntarily terminate that lease. Um, we're in the process right now of terminating uh, hundreds of mineral leases that were issued within the past three years um, that, where the explorer has, the explorers have requested termination. So back to the Blandin language, um, we do recognize that in some instances there may be mining. So kind of the second level of, um, of addressing that in the Blandin conservation easement um, was to require those lands to um, be reclaimed um, in accordance with state mineland reclamation laws. And the hope would be to reclaim those so that they could be revegetated, recontoured um, for forest use consistent with the forest management plan for, for Blandin. Uh, if that can't be done, then we go to the third level, which is requiring substitution of lands. And the state of Minnesota, as the <coughs> easement holder, and as the mineral, um, the mineral uh, rights holder, would be responsible for that substitution of lands. It could be either in fee or in conservation easement. And those lands would have to be of the same um, land type, land quality, as the blanded lands are. So with that, uh, we have um, some links to the DNR uh, website in our presentation um, and also to Minnesota Statutes Chapter 93, which pertains to minerals lands. We have a lot of resources on our website about minerals that you may find helpful, and we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, ladies. Um, council members, um, any questions? Very interesting. Uh, yes, so, Senator. Take me back to the Blandin easement again. Um, that, that can be managed for, for logging if, if yes. necessary, correct? And yes. If, and, and if there's, if there's mining that needs to be done there, they, it, it can be mined also, correct? That is correct. It is a working forest easement, um, and um, we actually have leased some of those lands since the easement was issued. Uh, those leases may have been terminated by now, um, but uh, um, you know that was very expected with state minerals uh, in such a large acreage that there would be mineral leases and potential um, exploration, potential mining. And and I and I think I'm right on this, but um, the tr two trust funds you mentioned, the school trust fund and the university trust fund, the vast majority of the money that's in there is from logging and mining. Isn't is that correct? Actually, the vast majority is from mining. There mm -hmm. there is money from from uh, timber harvest as well, but um, I don't know the exact percentage. But it's somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of the revenues that have been deposited in those count, accounts, I believe, um, have been from mining. And they and they go to every single student in the state of Minnesota and the uh, university scholarships uh, I think like 20 percent of all incoming freshmen get a get a get a mining get a mining scholarship from the university trust fund a thousand dollar or two thousand dollars some kids don't know they exist so they don't apply for them so they could probably be even more but um, you have to actually be a pretty good student in order to get one though if I'm not mistaken is that correct I'm, I'm not privy to the details okay. of getting one of those scholarships, I'm, but I will certainly look I'm, into it. I'm pretty it. sure that's what it is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any, any other questions, Council? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, could you tell me how do we deal with uh, sand and gravel on the vast amount of WMAs the state of Minnesota has? Uh, where does that revenue and, how, and the decision making to allow that to happen? Um, well, uh, um, 
I'm, I'm not sure. It, it kind of depends on the land class, whether we're actually selling sand and gravel from WMAs. You know, the primary purpose of the WMAs is for, for uh, wildlife protection. But there may be some school trust parcels that are WMAs where we do want to um, sell that revenue. And then it, it would depend on the land class, um, where the revenue gets distributed. If it's school trust revenue, it would, it would go to the permanent school fund. Yes, so if I could follow up, so if we um, bought some land with Lassard Sam's money and there were not severed mineral rights, so in acquiring the surface rights, we, we got the mineral rights and it, um, say there was gonna be a big road project in the neighborhood and there was an opportunity for the state to get a bunch of money by sending the, selling the gravel and then restoring the land. Is that not an allowable, and maybe you're the wrong person to ask, but it would seem that would make sense to do and maybe the money would then go back to Lassard Sam's, I'm assuming, to buy more land after this land's restored or do we not allow that to happen? Well, you, there would be a notice of funding restrictions filed and then the, um, in order to um, engage in any kind of activity that is a change in use, um, the, the uh, DNR would have to seek permission from the large, uh, Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council <coughs> and potentially repay funds. I do know that we've had, um, for example, some transmission lines on some of the large working force easements where we had to come, we, we had to get permission and then repay. Um, but, you know, the sand and gravel is not the primary purpose of the WMA program, obviously. And so um, uh, I think it, we would have to look at the circumstances to see whether the DNR even thought that was an appropriate use. And if so, if, if LSOHC um, funding is used, we would have to go through the appropriate requirements. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Chair, just to follow up, I know the one we did in Dakota County along the Vermilion River, there when we purchased it, we specifically allowed the landowner 10 or 15 years to mine the gravel and then it would be turned over to DNR to use. And I was just wondering if it came along the opportunity, sometimes the uh, Minerals, we come to find out, when I say minerals, sand, and gravel, we find out to be worth more than the land even costs. Somebody's willing by uh, paying us the mineral rights, and I think it would be in the best interest of the state to collect that money, and I'm kind of thinking, like you're alluding to, that might not even be a possible consideration based on current state <coughs> law. Thank you. So, Mr. Chair, um, Representative McNamara, um, my understanding on that project, the Vermilion um, project, is that... Uh, uh, Outdoor Heritage Fund was not used on the portion of uh, that acquisition where the the owner, uh, which was Semstone, retained gravel rights. I think there were other funds used. I'll have to look into that, but that's my recollection. Okay. Um, there are no further questions. I just have, it's really not a question. It's like, who came up with this idea of severing the mineral rights with the rest of the land? It's, Seems like it just has complicated everybody's life. I'm going to defer to Vicki Sellner. <laughs> Must be an attorney then. Yeah, um, I don't know where the original concept of that came from, um, but certainly in, with the state of Minnesota regarding severing its the minerals from uh, lands it sells, that originally came from the state auditor. And um, back in the 1880s, um, it actually was only confined to the Arrowhead region of the state, St. Louis, Lake, and Cook counties. Uh, that auditor had some information that there was valuable iron ore resources in that area and thought that the state of Minnesota and all of its citizens should benefit from the revenues generated from that. And then eventually, at the turn of the, uh, the, cent the last century, um, they made it mandatory for all counties in the state. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, ladies. Appreciate it. Um, thank you. All right. Uh, moving on to um, number 11 here, a review in the progress uh, of our draft accomplishment plans. Um, Mark, do you uh, want to lead this? Uh, Mr. Chair and members, as you're, uh, you each had received the um, new packets with the 
uh, draft accomplishment plans, the redrafts. And most of those are the changes were done in the budgets uh, and in the, in the tables at the end. Also along with that, you received this spreadsheet that was inside the front cover in the, that uh, gave the questions and answers basically that were applied to those or provided to the project managers so that they could um, give us some more information on any questions the council had or the staff had. So that was all distributed to you. Um, from a staff standpoint, and, and uh, Joe or Sandy may uh, comment on this as well, but it seems like we received really good replies from the uh, response from the project managers on the questions and giving us the answers. Um, some good insights as to why things changed and I think it was pretty well spelled out and everything. I, staff, I don't, and I don't believe the, the other staff have any real heartburn on any of these um, to bring to your attention. Uh, we don't know of any council members that do it this time either, but if you do, please speak up. You may have other questions you want to ask of the project managers. Um, our goal at this point is to just make sure that the council has had adequate time to review these and that um, we can progress them so that we can process into or move into the process of making the bill or uh, writing the bill. So, I, Mr. Chair, it's any questions, I guess, for the council? Any questions about, about, and maybe <clears throat> have you had time to look at the staff notes here? I only had one, and I'll just throw it out there, and, and um, uh, Maybe somebody in the audience can answer me. The Minnesota Land Trust, I noticed, is in here several times. Uh, and this is something we, a few of us, have been thinking about. The leverage that's, uh, that we're told is possible and then comes back that it's not possible. Uh, but for some of us, we base some of our decisions on how much leverage is coming in to get more bang for the buck because... Mr. Hartman likes to say. And then I see several of these now. It says uh, leverage anticipated has been reduced. Um, uh, there might be legitimate reasons, but I'm kind of curious about uh, uh, why. And um, it may be going forward, and it's probably not for discussion now, but maybe going forward, uh, we don't ask for anticipated uh, leverage. We ask for uh, leverage that is for sure, so to speak. Uh, anyway, uh, does that raise any, um, maybe the folks from the Minnesota Land Trust could, uh, I think they're here. Wayne, yeah. Thank you, gentlemen, and just for the record, Identify yourself, please. Mr. Chair, members, Chris Larson, Executive Director of the Minnesota Land Trust. And I'm Wayne Osley. I'm the Director of Land Protection for the Minnesota Land Trust. Well, thank you. I just was going through this because it's, and, and, and the Minnesota Land Trust came up several times in the category of our, our uh, leverage is reduced, as, as anticipated, is no longer there. I'm just sort of curious, how, how does that happen or, or or, yeah, yeah, how does this happen? In general terms, we, we try to keep it at that, you know, relative percent. So if we propose the budget um, of X million dollars and the request was funded at, say, 40 percent, we'll try to keep our leverage uh, estimate close to 40 percent. In some instances, though, um, we may be getting down, depending on that funding level, to where we there's a, a chance that instead of working for, with like six, seven, eight different landowners, you're down to one or two, and then things get really constrained in terms of uh, the opportunities before us. And so it's one instance where you know you might have a very good project from an ecological, biological sense with no leverage associated with it versus one that may be a little less, you know, less quality and, and may have some, some leverage associated with it. So what's the better alternative in those instances? Because you just don't have very much wiggle room to play with. Um, so that's an example where, you know, I think there were maybe one or two of the accomplishment plans where we brought that 
into consideration just because the opportunity field is being limited to, to that degree. But generally, uh, our estimates in our accomplishment plans are pretty conservative. And if we look across all of the uh, you know, grants that are open that we're a partner to, we'll see and have good record of that we're consistently overachieving on those uh, leverage amounts. So uh, what we try to do is, is put our best estimate forward in terms of where we think we'll come in. Uh, but then, you know, we're, keep in mind we're consistently over delivering on those as well. We like overachieving. So. <laughs> I would just add this, uh, and I uh, don't want to take everybody's time here, but I noticed uh, a, a lot of the proposals were anticipated leverage from the landowners, where they were going to give you or somebody else something for a lot less than what the market value was or whatever. And so in my little mind, I go, what if that guy changes his mind? And then it's all gone the anticipated leverage and my high score as far as dollars to whatever project that is now is not what I thought it would be as far as bang for the buck. So that, that, that's one thing that's just been bothering me. If you have a solution to this, I'd be happy to hear it. Well, I, I can also talk about, you know, our process, we don't have the landowners identified typically on the front end. There's some instances where we do, but we do go through that RFP process to identify the landowners and uh, we make it very explicit that, uh, you know, we're looking for the high ecological value properties, but we also encourage the landowners to participate in terms of uh, donation of easement value into the equation too. So that comes into play. And so, um, I forgot where I was going with this. <laughs> but, um, so, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we, we, it's, it's, you know, again, it's, it's kind of based on the estimates and the track record in those relative program areas. There's the geographies of the state were consistently, we're, we're pulling in higher leverage and, and donative value than other parts of the state. So if we get working in, you know, the more agricultural parts of the state where people need to make a living on the land, the ability for them to participate in terms of uh, donated value is, is far less than if you're talking about uh, properties where somebody owns it because it's it's you know a, a second home or they bought it for hunting purposes or or lakeshore and and some of those things as well so it's it's an evolving practice with us we're, I think we're getting pretty good in terms of estimating the type of leverage and the amount that's coming in but yeah it's it's not locked in for certainty I know and please don't consider my questions uh, as uh, questioning the good work that you folks do, but um, uh, it's a never-ending quest for this council, I do believe, to make sure our money goes as far as it can go. Yeah. And so, hence, uh, uh, these questions. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, I think it is a good question about the leverage, and we'd be happy to provide you with the looking backwards on how we've performed. And we, I think we included that in with each proposal, but we could consolidate those. So you could just see, you know, get some confidence from that track record, which I think speaks for itself. And going in on the front end, it's always a little hard because we're going through that RFP process. So we've tried to be conservative on the front end, and that's why we wanted you to know that this has been reduced by that because we want to make sure we can hit that target number. So that, but looking back, we'd be happy to provide that. Well, thank you for that. Lord knows there's a lot of projects with zero, uh, so <laughs> we, we don't appreciate that so much. Uh, no further questions. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks so much. Thank you. And, uh, Council, any further questions about uh, uh, the uh, draft accomplishment plans? Any Anything you want to direct to staff, uh, Ms. Swenson? Uh, just some comments on what you brought up. I also noticed that in the uh, staff notes and, and struggled with that as well. And I know um, in the proposals we've seen, not every gr group has brought forward the same um, approach to the leverage calculations. And I, I noted what you said about actual versus assumed. And one, one other thing that I was thinking of is, is maybe there's uh, two separate columns. One is the, the um, landowner donation as part of the leverage as assumption in comparison to other types of leverage. And there's just an idea that I had had based on what you had said. 
Well, keep that in mind because uh, Chairman Hartwell and myself have talked about uh, down the road here, uh, uh, before we have to go through this process again, we will have a meeting and discuss among ourselves how we can fine tune these questions and uh, fine tune um, uh, so we are getting a more a clearer picture of what's going on. So, um, are we done with this this part of it, Council? Uh, okay, well, I, I, we need a motion to uh, progress the plans and direct staff to proceed uh, with the bill draft. All right, we have a, um, a motion, and I have since been corrected. We don't need a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. It is done as we speak. Okay. Um, coming up, uh, talking about the calendar, any questions there, uh, Mr. Johnson? Yeah, Mr. Chair and members, we had a couple of things. Uh, actually, w one thing first. The, the first thing, let's try that. Um, Chair Hartwell had mentioned previously, I think at the last meeting, that he was having, uh, he had trouble, he couldn't make the April 29th meeting, and he offered some other alternatives and asked that we put that out as a doodle poll to the members. The doodle poll came back. Thank you, each of you, for responding to that. The meeting in question was April 29th, and the um, there were five different dates between mid-April to mid-May given out. All members can uh, attend, except for yourself, Mr. Chair. Uh, all members are able to attend the April 15th meeting, or, or moving that meeting to April 15th, potentially, from April 29th, which is a Wednesday, to April 15th, which is a Wednesday. That is the Wednesday after Easter. It's the day after the, the uh, legislature returns to session. I think I can't make April 15th because I'm paying my taxes. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know why I said I couldn't make that meeting, so uh, let's let's <laughs> let's wait. Maybe I, I can be here. So um, the other four potentials uh, had multiple members who could not make each. Uh, so as it stands, it would it looks like we have a uh, consensus that April 15th would be an alternative date to April 29th, and if the chair and council wish, we can make that adjustment in the agenda and place April 15th as the, uh, as the tentative April date. Any thoughts out there? I'm sorry, what, you're gonna... We're gonna switch the April 29th meeting to April 15th. You don't have an income mark, so you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Taxes. <laughs> Anything else? Anybody else have any comment? Uh, um, Ms. Winston? Uh, just a, a request to do a doodle poll for the council hearings in September, to potentially move those back into August. Mm. And we can do that, Mr. Chair, if you'd like. We do a doodle poll to the members that would, uh, um, we could look at moving the meetings potentially back to uh, the the week prior, which would be the last week of August. Um, staff will have to look at seeing how that will reflect with regards to processing of materials. Um, I'm not sure how that will jive with us right now, but we can we'll, we can definitely check that. Also, uh, Member Swanson, is there a, a moving later, moving earlier? Was that kind of what you had in mind was looking at last week in August? Yeah. Well, we, I guess we, had, we, I mean, what's wrong with the survey, huh? Sure. And we can come back to the next meeting with that information. Sure. All right. Thank you. Any other dates complex your life? All right. Um, last item, I do believe, if I can find my own, is um, opportunity to address the consul. And I think there was one gentleman here who wanted to do that. Um, I don't see him. Um, are you, would you like to address the council, sir? Mr. Chairman, I'm not on your list, but if I could add your indulgence, I would make a restatement. Absolutely. That's what we're here for. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Bob Tammon from 
Sudan, Minnesota. My wife and I are retired up there. I spent several years working in the mines, and I recall Tom Rukavina saying that 10,000 jobs disappeared, I think starting in the 80s. One of them was mine, so I'm familiar with the economy of the range, and that's what I want to comment on briefly, being we had that presentation on minerals. And we always hear the numbers, millions and billions of dollars, tremendous amount of money floating around. But actually, I think we should realize that mining is a very small part of Minnesota's economy. And for my numbers, I rely on the Department of Commerce Bureau of Economic Analysis that puts out the gross national product numbers, gross domestic product. They break it down by state, they break it down by industry. Minnesota's gross domestic product is $368 billion. Pretty good sized economy. Mining is $2,386,000,000, far less than 1% of Minnesota's economy. So very important to some people, not very important to the economic welfare of the state of Minnesota. It's a little more than a rounding area error. Then I would point out that as far as protecting our industry, which I'm greatly in favor of having money go f run uphill from St. Paul to Sudan, but uh, there's a cost to protecting our mining industry. And I just read the papers when the president put those import duties on steel to raise the price of our ore and our steel. Polaris made an announcement that they were going to budget another $8 million for their operations in Minnesota. So we're benefiting one Minnesota industry at the expense of another. And I know it's a balancing act, and that's why I throw this out here. You're making decisions about where Minnesota's money goes. So when you make those decisions, you should uh, understand that mining is a very small part of our economy, and our ore bodies are not likely to improve that situation. Our iron ore, 25%, steel roughly. Globally, we got a lot of 50%. Uh, Brazil, Australia, Sweden. Our copper is less than, most of our ore bodies, less than 1% mineralization, 1% copper. Uh, I was online a couple uh, weeks ago and I see the top 10 ore bodies globally, they all run between 2 and 8% copper. So we're going to face this situation. And I lived through this with, and I think a lot of you are familiar, Masabi Nugget, Magnetation. When the price of pellets is 180 bucks a ton, we're money makers. When the price of pellets goes down to 45, they're all bankrupt. And so I just ask you to take that into consideration as you make your decisions, which I think you do with a good amount of honest deliberation. So thank you for what you do for the state of Minnesota, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman. Um, Yes, so Senator. If, if Representative Rocavina were here, he'd be screaming and yelling at you about not understanding <laughs> how important mining is to the state of Minnesota and how important that is to the iron range. And the 1% copper that you're talking about is one of the largest copper reserves in the entire world in northern Minnesota. And mining is extremely, extremely important to our area of the state. And you are a beneficiary of it, and you should know what it's like to not have a job when you live on the iron range and what happens to the people that had to leave. So. Um, to come in front of this committee and tell us that mining is not important is absolutely outrageous. Mr. Chairman? Yes, but, uh, oh, let, let's, <clears throat> we could continue this. We're mostly interested in ducks and pheasants, uh, but just for the record, sir, what your name again? I'm Bob Tamman from Sudan, Minnesota, and Senator Tomasoni is right. Rukavina beat up on me every chance he had. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are in rage types. You always fight in any way, so there you go. <laughs> Mr. McNamara. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Unrelated, uh, when we uh, poll members on the uh, September 1, 2, 3 dates, and uh, Member Swenson asked us to consider uh, late August, could we also consider coming after Labor Day? <coughs> Just a possibility. Thank you. Well, yeah, we'll put out that. Uh, all right, we have one more, I think, person who wished to speak to us. He's, uh, he's uh, been here before. We welcome him. I told him he's got to keep it short and sweet, but, and he said he would. 
And your name, please. Uh, for the record, my name is Rick Heller. I officially represent the twice exceptional people with print disabilities found in Minnesota Statute 120B15, the Gifted and Talented Programming Statute, where you, where you find twice exceptional. You find print disability found in the Higher Education Opportunity Act of 2008 with blind, those are only two, or in the IDEA Act of, of uh, 2004 uh, amended. I, have, I currently do have two handouts, if you don't mind, uh, to provide those as I quickly talk here if you got a minute. I, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, this is the first opportunity to speak that you have captioning. You're moving the bar up on uh, digital accessibility for everybody to access it. The reason I provided these handouts today, the one with uh, the sheet marked in the orange corner uh, you'll find that's a captioning and subtle, subtle benefit all students for increasing literacy. The reason it's a, from the Commission Death Blind, uh, they published it uh, in April 2011. It's a lar large document, but you can look it up. Uh, people can find this online. Again, it's called Captioning and Sub Subtitling Benefits Students All for Increased Literacy. I marked the item B for today. Also on the back is a different website, Social Security. Uh, dot gov uh, on accessibility, what I've highlighted there, and I marked that one uh, item C, it talks browse aloud, it helps uh, difficult, those who have difficult reading text online uh, or literacy problems. And uh, there may be uh, learning disabilities, dyslexia, English is a second language. The beneficial tool of browse aloud, it highlights and reads the words out loud. So this is for likely for the older, older audience. So we got the younger, and we got the older for legacy here today. Now, about the web pages, that marked item A. I have circled the live video, and again, now you have captioning. And, th and thank you for uh, that consideration as well, and hopefully that'll continue. Uh, again, that item is marked A. However, when you turn the page over, which is, uh, one is the uh, calendar, and the, and, the, and the back page is, the, uh, is your web page, uh, there's a document I've checked there, and attached to that was a screenshot made on that, and it's, it's from the DNR. If people would check their documents, like you can see there's no author on the metadata there, but you do have a call file, a 2F. That's how they file it here. But if you put the author there, at least they can go back and know how to fix that. For instance, the clean legacy, leg, uh, clean, uh, clean water legacy, and, and legacy uh, logo is not tagged. That's why I put page one on there. Uh, the, the last page, uh, page 12 of 12, uh, that does not, is not properly uh, accessible. As I expressed before, uh, I believe this is probably a DNR document. However, uh, the DNR has to do accessibility law, the legislature doesn't. Your documents that you've created uh, using uh, Becky, Sandy, and Amanda are functionally accessible, and I appreciate that. You're doing your due diligence on that. But again, when you accept documents from state agencies, uh, there's no protocol for them to, to pre-check those documents. However, Jay Wyant, on his strategy, five-year strategy plan last year, recommended everybody for a state agency manually check their documents for functionality before they, before they submit them. The last piece I would like to, maybe two pieces to add, that you don't have a sign-in sheet. Most commissions have a sign-in sheet. You might want to consider that in the future. All the commissions I've gone to have a sign-in sheet. And then as far as uh, the PowerPoints, uh, you had PowerPoints today. They're not online. And hopefully they'll post them online. Uh, I looked at the other handouts online and, and used, the, used the required software uh, from prior meetings. They're posted there, but they're not they're not compliant. So again, not going back, but not forward. Think about that in the future. If you created a policy about what timeliness is, then your staff, uh, such, you know, such as uh, Becky or uh, Sandy or Amanda, uh, have t timely to put the stuff together for the public to have this stuff at the same time uh, as everybody else, the same opportunity. Again, thank you uh, for this opportunity to speak. I'm open to any questions if anybody has any. Well, thank you for your comments. I was just informed that uh, uh, some of the uh, the items you saw today will be posted, so uh, you can look forward uh, to that. 
Thank you very much. Um, anybody else would like to speak? If not, um, it's time to say goodbye for the Thanksgiving season. Uh, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Nobody wants to quit? So moved. <laughs> so moved. So moved. Uh, all in favor, aye? Aye. Same here. We're adjourned.